So this all kind of started a few years ago when I was working at a company. Our back end was written in Scala. There were so many issues with it that we decided to just completely overhaul the architecture. But we were going to do it right. We were going to be functional. We added Scala Z. We added the state monad. It was going to be beautiful until we started seeing Stack Overflow errors. And this was just in testing. We hadn't even deployed anything to production yet. So my coworker says, let's just trampoline it and add the free monad. And that was kind of my reaction to that comment. I didn't know what he meant. That was the first time I'd heard of the free monad. And then a couple of years later, I'm at a different company in a different Scala code base. And there was this one application no one wanted to touch. I finally looked at the code, and I understood why. We were using the free monad to manage a very simple data store application. The purpose of the application was really straightforward, but the code made it look really complicated. This might sound familiar. So I wanted to understand if I was justified in being annoyed with that application, so decided to figure out what the heck a free monad is so you don't have to. Uh, my name's Kelly Robinson, and I'm an engineering team lead here in San Francisco at a company called ShareThrough. And today I'm going to talk to you about why the free monad isn't free. So before we talk about free monads, we're going to talk about monads, and we're going to explain that using monoids and monads. This explanation is going to be a little bit shorter than I would like because of the time constraints. There's a talk later this afternoon that's going to go into some of this stuff in detail, I hope. If you are not familiar with these concepts, which don't be afraid if you're not, that's fine. Go to that talk, and hopefully you can get a better understanding. All right. We've all heard monads are simply monoids in the end category of endofunctors, but what does that mean? So we're going to start by talking about monoids. Monoids are an idea that comes from category theory. They come from math. These are ideas that are not implemented in the Scala language, but we can represent them using Scala. So a monoid is some type that is going to have a couple of methods on it. It's going to have an append method, and that basically means that you're going to take two of the type, put it together to create one of the type. And then you're going to have some method, usually called identity, that's going to be a no-op or zero. It's going to have no effect when used with the append method. So we can look at a couple examples of this. String concatenation is a really good example of a monoid. You can take two strings, put them together, and you have another string. And then for the identity value to have no effect, you use the empty string, string monoids. Another great example of a monoid is integer addition. So if you take two integers and put them together, you have another instance of an integer. And then for the identity value to have no effect, you set it to 0. So it's like a super, super brief introduction to monoids. And that brings us to talking about monads. We can use monoids to kind of you build our understanding of monads. So I really like this quote from a Stack Overflow post that says, the term monad's a bit vacuous if you're not a mathematician. An alternative term is computation builder. So like monoids, you build computations using that append method. You can do something similar with monads. And this helps my argument that you don't need to be a mathematician to understand this stuff. These are ideas. These are ideas that we can use in our programs to make ourselves more productive. So in Scala, this is kind of what a monad's going to look like. A monad's going to be some collection, some family of types that's going to have a couple of methods defined on it. It's going to have a pure method, and that's going to lift the value into the container, into that context creating the monad, and then it's also going to have the flat map method. And this is going to apply a function to every value inside of the container, and then flatten a context. So we can look at an example of what a monad is using Scala's option. And so some of you may know that option is a monad. You might not really know what that means. And for very simplistic overview, this is how we could represent option as a monad. So it's going to have a pure method. I talked about that lifting into the context. It's wrapping a value in the sum type. And then you also have the flat map method. And you can see here how we're pattern matching on the different contexts to apply a function to the contained value if there is something there, and then flattening that context. We don't wrap it in another sum. We want it to come out flattened at the end of the day. So monads are useful because they allow us to compose functions for values in a context. And the reason that this is useful is because at the end of the day, when you're building programs, when you're making tons of HTTP calls, creating futures of requests, you don't want to be left with a future of a future of a future of a future of a future. You just want to be left with a future of your result. And that's the type of thing that we use monads for in our programs. 
Okay, that was like the briefest introduction to monads ever. Let's talk about what it means to be free now. So, we use the word free to mean a few things. Let's clarify what I mean when I'm talking about free and when we talk about free in the context of free monads. We're talking about free as unrestricted, not free as in zero cost. Free to be interpreted in any way. That's what we want to focus on. Or, if you're a fan of Richard Stallman, you can think of this as free as in freedom and not free as in beer. So let's revisit kind of our building blocks. Let's talk about what it would mean to be a free monoid. So a quick refresher, we have monoids, uh, the append method and the identity method. In order for a monoid to be free, we can't lose any input data while we're doing that append step. And we want to keep it free from interpretation. So let's look at an example of what this would mean. So a list concatenation could be a really good example of a free monoid because when you take two lists and shove them together, you're doing just that. You're just shoving the data together and creating a new list that has no interpretation of the underlying type. You're not losing input information about what came into the append function. You're shoving the data together. And it's important here that in Scala, we define this with a generic type because we don't know what is contained in that. It could be in list, another list, it could be an int, a string, a function, other complex types. We don't know. And that means that we can't make any interpretation about the underlying data. Keeps it free from interpretation. And that's why this monoid is free. In contrast, something like integer addition is not free because when you take two integers and put them together, you're losing information about the input types, the input data. You don't know what those inputs were to the existing result. And so that's why this isn't free. It's an explicit interpretation of the integer type. And that brings us to free monads. So the important thing that we want to remember here is that we can't lose any data during that append, that flat map, that composition step. We can't lose any data about the input to those functions. So how are we going to build up this idea in Scala? We can do this using some constructors that we define ourselves. So we can start with some trait free. I'm sure Adrian has feelings about using traits for this. But we can start with some trait free, add a class return that's going to be used in our free or in our pure functions and to indicate that there's no more computation. And then we'll add a class suspend and this is going to be used to indicate we're going to suspend the computation until we're ready to process and do some interpretation at a later point in time. And then we'll add a class flat map, and this is going to be used to chain methods together to keep the data free, to keep the information about the inputs as we're building up our structures. And this looks a lot like the flat map method signature, and that's going to help us out. So then we're going to add some functions to help with our composition. This will be help with some of the syntactic sugar that we love in Scala. And this will allow us to chain these methods together. But again, we're not going to evaluate anything doing this. We just want to build up some ideas about what we're talking about doing. And so let's look at an example of what this would look like. So if we build a free monad for actions on a to-do list, we can start with some kind of syntax, some kind of DSL for actions on a to-do list. We'll add a class to create a task, to complete a task, to retrieve some tasks. But these are just talking about some actions. These aren't actually doing anything. They're just representing some data. And then we'll add some methods that will lift those representations into our free monad, that will suspend them into that context so that we can do the interpretation at a later point in time. And the reason this is free is, again, because we haven't done anything yet. We're just kind of talking about what we want to do. We're representing the data in this very explicit way so that we can interpret it at a later point in time. So when we chain these together, it's going to end up looking something like this. And so this is pretty cool. We can use a for comprehension. This is pretty easy to read. Most of you might think this looks familiar to a lot of stuff that exists in your Scala programs. And this might again, look familiar, but the difference here is nothing has actually happened yet. Again, we're just talking about what we want to do. And underlying that data structure, this is what's going to be under the hood. We've chained these operations together in this list-like nested structure to represent the actions that we're talking about taking, shoving the data together, right, like we did with the list monoid. And so, the reason that this is free is because, again, nothing is evaluated. There's no operations defined. And that's why it's free from interpretation. We can call this a free monad. 
So why would anyone do this? There's a couple reasons. One of the big ones that people talk about is deferring side effects. So when we say that we're going to defer all of the evaluation, that means that the actual I.O. of our programs or whatever you want to do that's going to cause a side effect, that's also deferred until the very end. We're composing functions but not computing them. And then that syntax tree that we defined, the DSL for our to-do list, that can be used to create multiple interpreters to then later define what we want to do with that data. If I write out a list of instructions and hand it to everyone in this room, you're all going to interpret that a little differently. That's kind of what we're doing with the free monad. And then if you think about something like this, maybe this looks familiar to some things that you have in your programs. Use your imagination for what those do something functions do. They could be side affecting or they could add another thousand calls to the stack. But in the course of our programs, things are going to start to look like this. Every function in the monadic context is going to be added to the stack. So remember my coworker? Just trampolina and add the free monad. So when we talk about trampolining, we're talking about expressing all of the control flow, all of the function passing, all of those chain functions. We want to express that in a loop instead of putting additional functions on the stack. We want to achieve stack safety by using heap instead of stack. The free monad comes down to this exact trade-off. It's going to use more heap instead of using additional stack frames. So remember our expanded lists like syntax. This is the big the data structure that we've essentially created that's going to take up that space on the heap instead of taking up space on the stack. And so in order to keep this free and trampoline, what we want to do is when we interpret this, we want to make sure that we evaluate it using a loop. We don't want to put any additional functions on the stack. So we'll very quickly go over what the, the evaluation function for this will look like. This is the function signature. You can see how it takes some input, your free monad that you want to evaluate. And then it's going to take a transformer. This is going to what's going to be what will do the actual evaluation. And then we also have this implicit, con this implicit constraint that the transform type is also a monad. So that functor transformer, you might also hear this called a natural transformation. And in some programs, it also has that really confusing symbolic operator. I wanted to be very explicit about what it's doing. It's a functor transformer. That's what it's going to do to do the interpretation. And so when we look at the function body for this evaluation, we can see a couple of things that stand out here. This is already a lot of code, so I've left it off. It's in my GitHub. You can look at it later. But the important things to take, keep in mind here that this is going to use tail recursion, which is in Scala going to put, again, turn things into a loop instead of putting additional functions on the stack. And it's going to pattern match on those cases that we define for our free monad, the return, the suspend, and the flat map. The important thing to note with this pattern match is that the transformation is going to happen on that suspend step. This is where the interesting stuff happens. This is where the evaluation occurs. And so let's look at a couple of examples of interpreters for this. So we can define a test interpreter. And this is going to take some input list of actions. It's going to start being empty. And we're going to build up our expected list of actions using this test interpreter. And so in the body of the supply method to create the test interpreter, you can start to see how the evaluation will happen. And so we're pattern matching on that DSL to define the actions that we want to take. And this is where you can start to think about how you would define multiple interpreters. You know, We've defined here creating a task to be adding it to that variable list of actions. But in your production interpreters, this will probably be making a database call. And so the cool thing about this is then you can then create test interpreters, production interpreters, maybe multiple production interpreters if you have different use cases for that. But you can start to kind of see how this would take shape. And this would how this is how you run it. So you'll feed your list of to-dos to the run free function, give it the instance of the test interpreter or the interpreter in general that you want to use. And then you can see here how we've compared it to our expected list of actions. And for something like this, a to-do list, something that's probably going to, in production, be hitting a database, causing some side effect, the really nice thing about the free monad is then you can then define a test interpreter that will bypass all of the side affecting parts of your code. You can test that the program is going to evaluate the code in the order that you expect it to, but you don't have to use testing mocks anymore. 
And then really quickly, this is an example of what your production interpreter might look like. You can see how you're returning an option instead of a trivial context. And this is probably going to look a little different than your test interpreters, and that's expected. So again, there's a several reasons that people are using free monads. I've talked about a few of them. But I think the thing that I want to impress upon you is that a lot of times people are using abstractions like this simply because they can. They think it's a cool way to use the code. And that's fine, but there's usually an easier way. So last year, Jessica Kerr gave a really great talk at Scala Exchange where she talked about Blue Sky Scala. So the, the easy stuff in our applications, the green grass, all the way up to the outer space stuff, the, the, you know, the, the hard stuff in outer space. And the free monad isn't free because it falls into that outer space category. Its applications are impressive, but the path to get there is pretty broken. And why is that? So composition is great. We love using monads in our programs. But that boilerplate that you're going to have to build up to create the abstract syntax tree, you're taking all of the implicit actions in your code and turning them into explicit data types. That's going to be a lot of work for you. And then the learning curve for some of this stuff. I can guarantee that if you've never heard of this, my 20-minute talk is not going to be enough for you to go start using this in production. <laughs> this is going to take a while for you to grasp. Go talk to Rob Norris later. So it's easy to be frustrated with this. And a lot of that is because the context that a lot of explanations assume, especially for Scala developers, assume that you either have a background in category theory or that you came from Haskell. I really don't want to have to be linked to learn you a Haskell for great good anymore in any Scala documentation. <laughs> yes, thank you. But this is one of the reasons that it makes it really hard to maintain this kind of stuff. We want to stay in the blue sky. We want to be able to use things in our programs that make sense to us as developers. It was kind of like Adrian was saying in this talk just now, leave it to the compiler thing, to the, the compiler team to implement the hard stuff. Us as developers, we don't want to have to think about a lot of that stuff. And so this kind of motivates how we'll think about what we do with this. You should know your own domain. So I'm not saying that we can't use the free monad, but like everything in programming, it's all about trade-offs. So know your domain. Scala is very powerful. And a lot of you probably think about Scala as somewhere on this spectrum. Most people from Scala either think about it as like Java Scala or Haskell Scala. Know the expertise of your team. A lot of my team came from Java. And so even though we like functional programming and want to make use of a functional programming style, we're somewhat centered on this spectrum. And that's because we're going to hire, we're more likely to hire X Java engineers than we are X Haskell or X Idris engineers. So if you're doing a Greenfield project and considering putting some of this stuff into your code, ask yourself, are your coworkers going to understand this? Do you have the time and the tooling to make these things understandable to everyone and to the future versions of your team and yourself. And is this necessary for your business logic? That's one that people tend to forget. <laughs> and so this motivates how we think about alternatives. Depending on what the way that your code is structured now, I can tell you to use loops and more technically imperative style programming if that's something that your code will allow. But if you're highly invested in functional paradigms, that might not work for you. That's fine. But keep in mind, looping can be better, or it can be better for a lot of reasons. This is the Scala standard library from a while ago, at least. A lot of this stuff in Scala is built using vars and can build froms. And that's because it's technically more efficient. <laughs> we can also think about other ways to manage side effects. Not all side effects are bad. Keep in mind things like logging are really helpful. Think about how you would log using a free monad. Hint, you can't. Uh, and so things like this. You know, error handling is good, but Martin Odersky isn't going to smite you if you use a try accept block. This is perfectly acceptable. And this is a way that we thought about managing some of our side affecting code in a database. And so let's think about some of the things that exist for this in the real world. If you want to go play around with this, you can look at my GitHub. Or there's projects that exist that have implemented some of this already. Scala, Z, and Cats. Talk to Miles if you're interested in the Cats implementation. A lot of these have been defined in the Scala libraries there. You don't have to start from scratch. And kind of the reason that motivated this from the beginning is this is a Scala Z method that we use all over our code. Task is really helpful for concurrent programming. But this is what it looks like under the hood. And I don't know about most of you, but I don't really want to have to think about this stuff when I'm looking at my code. 
And this is the stuff that motivated this talk, is because there was code like this in our production systems. So what happened? Well, at the first company where my coworker said, let's just trampoline it and add the free monad, like two weeks after he said that, he quit. And then <laughs> we never added a free monad to that code base, which was fine because at that company, we were building a very, very basic web app. And the sign of Stack Overflow errors was like a really, really bad sign for us. And so we didn't have to do it because our business logic did not necessitate it. And then at the last company that I was at that was using the free monad to manage those data store, the reason that that code was complicated, I think largely did not have to do that it was with the fact that it was using the free monad, but the code was very over-engineered. And that's kind of a problem when you start to introduce concepts like this, is it's really easy to start to over-engineer your systems when you start introducing a lot of this stuff. Keep in mind that most of us are getting paid by a company that's using us to make them money. And at the end of the day, we might not need a lot of these abstractions. So for people in this room, take away from this talk, nothing else, know your domain, know what you need to do when you're building your systems. Be judicious in your use of these abstractions. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And sometimes it's OK to forego the most functional style for the sanity of your code and the sanity of your team. But most of all, if you're someone that understands this, share knowledge. Help build that learning gap. And if you're someone like me that's thinking about introducing these abstractions into your code base, I hope I've given you some tools to evaluate whether or not that's a good idea. Thank you.